painting on the Duke of Gloucester Street that I have witnessed, and I want to know if it is allowed, who allowed it, and who is allowed to do this. Um, I don't approve of it, and I hadn't really heard it being discussed before, but there are three sections down there that have been spray painted. Okay. Now maybe, maybe they're being eradicated in the meantime, but as of this morning, they had not. Thank you for hearing Thank me. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll certainly look into that, Ms. Victor. Thank you for coming forward. Would anybody else like to come forward and address council? Okay. Come on up, sir. Just state your name and address and try to limit your comments to five minutes. Hello. Uh, my name is Connor Sokolovsky, um, and I live at 1210 Richmond Road. And thank you all for being here and providing this open forum. Um, I'm actually here today as the elected class of 2023 president uh, and seek to bring up a number of concerns brought to me by many students. And so to start, I'd like to discuss the recent moratorium of the four person exception. Uh, so while it is clear that this moratorium may not be a direct attack on affordable off-campus housing for students, and that there are even plans in place to address this issue, um, for example, the Rent Ready program, uh, I would like to bring up some indirect negative consequences uh, of this. So students feel that this decision kind of undermines a system um, that has benefited hundreds of current student residents already. And they feel nervous that alternative plans may not be enacted quickly enough you know, to meet demand, especially considering the rise of anti-student sentiment in campus adjacent communities. And to speak to that, I've lived in Williamsburg almost my whole life. So my three sisters uh, and I all attended Matthew Whaley, for example. And I've noticed and loved like, the amount of adoration and respect that, that William and Mary receives from the larger Williamsburg community uh, and James City County included, uh, which was also a major factor in me coming to William and Mary in the first place. Uh, however, that same sentiment falls a little bit short in the communities geographically closest to William and Mary. Um, for example, I've been called out on the Planning Commission uh, for being a student in an open forum similar to this. I have witnessed um, pretty foul language used to describe student living situations and even students attending city events coming to speak or even not speaking. Uh, a recent Virginia Gazette article, uh, a last word piece actually, um, particularly disturbed a number of students um, as residents called on each other to enact a sort of police state vigilance, um, like counting the number of families really what seemed like a violation of privacy for a lot of students. And, and we really just want to make it clear that as the city works to preserve and enhance our neighborhoods, as stated in the comp plan, that it does not just take a vocal minority as the sole input into its decision-making process. We want to make it clear that yes, we do really care about these issues, but at the same time, we were unable to adequately represent ourselves when policy discussions occurred over the summer. Uh, we are here now and intend to work with the city and community to solve the underlying problems, uh, which a lot of these tighter regulations fail to address. Um, and, you know, we are valuable, valuable members of this community, uh, not just economically, um, but also due to the ideas, energy, and insights we bring to the table. I just want to thank you all for your time. Thank you, sir. I appreciate thank you. you coming forward. Would anybody else? Welcome, sir. Hey, guys. Uh, you know me. My name is Cody Armstrong. I'm a student at uh, the college, um, and I'm here to speak on the same thing Connor did. Uh, because truly, there is something going on in this city where ramping student anti-student sentiments are coming back. We've had histories of it in the early 2000s, and then we finally got students on the council, and it seems to be rearing its head again, which is not okay. We should not, and I know I come to speak as a class of 2022 senator, and I see a lot of students are really worried because of articles like Connor mentioned, that residents are actively looking to hunt down students who may be breaking the laws. And that shouldn't be the case. It should be with a soft hand, not a, a surveillance state that we try to fix problems. Um, and I think truly it does start here. It starts in this room. It starts with the wordings and how council, how city staff address these kind of issues. Um, specifically with the wordings of preserving our neighborhoods, what are, what are we preserving? We should be rather improving our neighborhoods. We should be working to find ways to fix problems that are um, 
that residents, like full-time residents are addressing, like parking, like trash pickup, like landscaping, things that actually can have solutions that get fixed rather than just let's create a rent ready program or let's just put a moratorium out there. Let us find actual solutions that like help students who are renters, not harm them because that's all that's going on right now. Student renters are being targeted and that's not okay. Um, I said this once and I'll say this a thousand times. Students are one of the biggest assets that w the city of Williamsburg has. The, the college brings in thousands and upon thousands of dollars of tourists, uh, tourism dollars. We bring over 6,000 students a year back in September that stay here 10 months to a year long. Um, and those bring businesses. Midtown Row would not exist today without the students being here. Let's just face that. If the college and another alternate universe was not here, the ability to build Midtown Row probably wouldn't exist. The ability to have Colonial Williamsburg would probably not exist. The college and our, our students are ground zero and the key to what makes the city of Williamsburg the city of Williamsburg. The businesses that are here, they survive on students. And that needs to be shown in how we move forward with the comprehensive plan, how we move forward with affordable housing and close housing to campus. There are so many options to fix the problems and help make sure students feel safe in this community. And at, at some point, it has to start with city council. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. But anybody else? Yes, ma'am, please come forward. Welcome. Hi, um, my name is Nobi Goodman. I live at 312 Cary Street, and I am student body vice president at William & Mary, so it's really nice to be here. Um, I'm just here to speak on what both Connor and Cody had also spoken on. Um, I myself live in, like, off campus, pretty close to campus, so it's one of those houses. Um, so I think you know, when I heard about this, I was really concerned. I was honestly pretty disturbed by some of the language. I think we should be very careful in how we speak about students and how we speak about their presence. And as Cody said, um, addressing issues in a way that is actually going to promote change rather than just punish students for existing. I think that's not exactly fair. And I also think that, um, like I said, just being very careful about the language we use um, regarding students, because at the end of the day, they're not, they are members of the community. Um, you know, we support the community, we live here, but they're also human beings. And um, I think that's just very, very important. And I think we should all remember that when speaking about students, so yeah. Thank you. Would anybody else like to come forward? Seeing none, I'll <coughs> close the open forum and move forward on the agenda. So first we have a public hearing, which is consideration and approval of the negotiated cable franchise agreement with Shenandoah Cable Television, LLC. Chris is on the docket, but we turn to Andrew. I think or, Mr. Excuse me, to Mark. Mr. Barham. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of Council. Uh, before you today is uh, the consideration and approval of a negotiated cable franchise agreement with Shenandoah Communications, otherwise known as Chantel. We thought it'd be a good and, and helpful opportunity for Chantel to be here to present a little bit about their company and the services they offer prior to the public hearing. So to that end, I've asked Chris Kyle, he's a vice president with Chantel, to provide you with a short uh, presentation. So Chris. Thank you. Good afternoon. There we go. Let me get oriented here with my lack of technology uh, expertise. It's not a good sign if you're bringing <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> Open myself up for that one. Then. Um, but my name is Chris Kyle. Um, I, I'm excited to be here, incredibly excited. What I'd like to do, if it's okay, is maybe take 10 minutes. You can interrupt me uh, at any time. These conversations probably work best if you do, but we can talk at, at the end of my presentation um, if you have any questions. But as, as Mark said, I, I, want, I wanted to say, you know, the reason I'm here at all is because of the leadership of city staff. Um, and, and this is just the beginning. 
Um, what we've always identified is the single most important determinant of our success on a project, and this is going to be a multi-million dollar project that I'm going to talk about, is, is the leadership from the city. And that's what we found here, and that's what's allowed us to be here today. So, so we're grateful for that. We did use the word cable. There's a regulatory reason for that, but make no mistake, and we do need, we will need approval for a cable franchise, but make no mistake, what I'm about to talk about is all about broadband. Um, Chantel, I thought it might be good to just talk for a few minutes about Chantel. Who are we? What kind of risk, you know, are you taking on uh, with this partnership that, that, that I was beginning to describe? And, um, I've worked with Chintel or worked at Chintel for almost 20 years, and uh, the short answer is uh, there is no risk, uh, and that's what's important uh, when, when we sit at the table and, and talk to our municipal partners. Uh, there's no risk operationally. We've done this before. We continue to do this. We've got a 100-year-plus history of executing on projects like this, and there's no financial risk. We have the financial resources to do this. We don't have to go borrow a bunch of money or, or, or raise money to do this. So um, I, I thought I'd just talk for a few minutes about our background um, and what we're going to bring to this market. We're not in this market now, uh, but we're very excited uh, about playing a small part in, in the growth of the market uh, here and what the future offers here in Williamsburg. So as I talked about, we're a publicly traded company. I like that. I am transparent. We will, as we go through this project, be meet, meeting with uh, municipal leadership to talk maps, talk things like that. Um, but you can see our numbers um, as a publicly traded company. But our strategy is real simple. We build great networks. We're going to be talking about one of those here in a second. We provide great customer support, and we partner with local communities. With a long-range horizon, if you build the infrastructure we're talking about building, if we've proven you can be very successful. And what we do can play a small role or be a very transformative effect on the communities that we serve, and that's what we seek to do. Um, you can see our employees, 800 employees, and then our revenues, $240 million in revenues. The project we're going to talk about here now, is, or in a minute, is what's called Fiber to the Home. So we want to pull fiber uh, across the city of Williamsburg, um, and that is the gold standard in, in our world. It's a form of broadband, uh, but it offers the highest speeds uh, available, and that's important whether you're working from home, whether you're learning from home. Um, it's, it's a quality of life issue um, for, for many communities. So that's who we are. Here's a map. If you haven't heard of us before, um, we, we always think that this is important to show that um, we have a pretty extensive footprint across the Mid-Atlantic. You'll notice on this map we're not in your area yet, but we've been coming west, and you, this is just the beginning. Um, we're not going to stop with just the city of Williamsburg, but this is our first stop. And um, you will see additional announcements, I, I feel certain, as we move through the rest of this year of us moving around Hampton Roads to do some additional construction. But uh, what's on this map here is on the blue lines, a lot of people ask if they're rivers. Uh, that's our fiber. That's our interstate um, network. And, you know, what we started thinking about several years ago is, you know, we've always used that for our own needs or for our most sophisticated clients. We have lots of universities that utilize our fiber network, hospitals, large, large, uh, sophisticated um, employers or private companies and, and governments. But... We, we, we had that technology and we started thinking about what if we took that to the residential market through this fiber to the home offering. And so that's what we, we've been doing here over the past few years. And then the purple dots, you can see where we've already launched Harrisonburg, Virginia, which is where I live. That's where I came from this morning. Um, Stanton, you know, uh, Winchester, Front Royal. The orange dots are under construction. There's a lot of activity uh, happening right now uh, with fiber to the home at Chintel. The, the gold colors, if, if you're wondering about that, those are our cable markets. And so, that, you know, going back to what we're asking for, we, we understand cable modem architecture. We, we have properties like your incumbent cable provider provides here. We, we know that technology, and we opted to do all of this new construction with a more advanced technology called fiber to the home. So what's on this map is a lot of different technologies that we offer. We have a lot of tools in our toolbox. What we're bringing to Williamsburg here is, is, is the most advanced, and that's fiber to the home. So that's where we are. 
So uh, um, what, would, what would we do here? It would be 100% fiber. It would be a triple play. That's another industry you know, term that I uh, just wanted to unpack for everybody. That's voice, video, and data. The linchpin on this whole business plan, though, is internet for us. But we do think, and we, what we've seen in our other markets, there is a, a, a segment of the population that still wants video. And so we can offer your traditional video package just like your incumbent incumbent cable provider can here. And uh, and then phone. It always surprises us how many um, people still want local phone for a variety of reasons. It's a declining business, uh, but it all runs over our fiber. And so that's the triple play. Um, the reliability of this network is one reason people um, you know, want this technology. It is a more reliable technology. There's less failure points in the network, okay? Um, but most importantly, it's got some speed advantages. A couple of advantages I just wanted to touch on um, would be it's symmetrical. And so what we've seen in COVID with the higher bandwidth demands people have placed on their home internet is it's not just how much you download, how much Netflix videos you're watching on your TV. It's, you know, your ability to push large files up from your house. And that's, that's the backside of internet. And that's when we say symmetrical. So when you purchase a gigabit of internet from us, you're getting a gig down and a gig up. That's important when you've got three kids learning from home and you're trying to work from home. There's lots of stuff going back up to the internet. And that was never the case before COVID. Uh, so that's just one one example of why this technology, um, why we've embraced this, this technology and, and what we're going to bring to Williamsburg. Um, another term is this passive optical, you know, architecture and fiber. There are just less fa failure points to it. And, uh, and because of that reliability, what we're finding is, you know, we feel people's internet is more important than their power right now. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, 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 that's where we are in today's world. And so, uh, um, anything we can do so once the fiber is in and there are, there is not a failure point, that's that's what we want to do. So that's our technology, and that's what we're that's what would be enabled through this 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 franchise. And this franchise is important because we have to get your public rights away to build. You, this is going to be an extensive project up and down the roads. We're going to um, schedule it, project plan it with city leadership, so it's not too disruptive. We want to get in and. And, and get out as quickly as possible, but we'll collaboratively develop this project plan. Um, we, what we, I think, underestimated from the beginning um, in our other markets is we talk a lot about technology, but the choice aspect. And um, consumers want an alternative. We like to talk technology, but consumers want an al alternative. And, and um, the other incumbent providers where we compete, and we compete with Cox in, in Roanoke, and they do a great job. Let me say they do a great job, but they will respond. And so that's the other piece of this. And the FCC and uh, the Department of Justice have done a lot of different studies, and not to bore you with the details, but what they found is when companies compete, consumers win. And, and that's what you're going to start finding here, but that's why we've got to get going and, and move through this market. Um, be, to protect ourselves, we're, you know, we'll, we'll have a, you know, this is going to be a multi-million dollar investment in Williamsburg, and um, and I think you'll start to see some interesting things a, as we do that. But um, what we've seen, Harrisonburg, I, I'd say, is a market very similar to Williamsburg. It's it's got a large hospital system, it's got a large university. That this is a technology that is valued um, not just by the existing. Economic, develop, economic base that you have, but to bring new employers in, new jobs, is incredible for that. Uh, for people to live here and work remotely, that's what this technology is for. This is what it enables. And that's, that's just some of the reasons why it's so exciting. So that's my benefits slide timeline. We've spent, I don't know, Mark, how long it's been, but the past couple of months working through this video franchise. Um, but that's just the beginning of this. That from, from your approval, when that happens, we will then move into project planning and pace that I was referring to. Um, there will be a full project plan, um, but then that will kick off, or in parallel to that, we'll start permitting evaluations. We have to understand what the city wants for permits, and we do this uh, you know, 
in a lot of different municipalities. Um, but we also have to work with the power companies, for instance, and they have their own permitting process. But um, everybody wants this technology. I would just say no one really thinks about, you know, it, it does take some lead time. We would expect to start construction within nine months of the approval of the video franchise to give you some idea and uh, have service turned up. And it, we're not going to wait to build the whole market before we turn service up. We'll build a neighborhood or series of streets, turn it up. You'll see our trucks. That generates a lot of excitement. And um, we don't wait for any of that. We just we go door to door and we do some mailers and people take our service. That's how it works. Um, but you know, in two years, um, we should have the vast majority of this community built out. It may take a little bit you know, longer to get a few of the out lying areas of the city. We've still got to figure out the university. We haven't contacted them. You've got the colonial piece here. So, so some, some unique things that, that, that we'll get figured out, but, um, but that's just some of what, what I've got listed here with municipal engagement. The utility engagement is the power company, um, but certainly um, public works is, is, is going to be very, a very important stakeholder for us and we'll work directly with them. Um, uh, the other thing I talk about is this will bring local jobs. Uh, there will be operation technicians for installs that will live locally in this area. We haven't gotten that far along to know, you know, will they actually live in this, the city of Williamsburg or James City, but, but there will be local jobs that, that are created by this, by this infrastructure investment. There will be salespeople, uh, there will be some marketing people. So people, um, you know, that are actively involved in this 21st century technology, but across what I like to say is different, different levels of sophistication in our industry. Uh, so it'll be open uh, to a variety of different backgrounds, and, and that's important to us. Um, and then last of all, but not least, is the community engagement. Once we have the full market built out, uh, we'll be coming back seeking to understand how we can best support the community uh, in the future. So I feel like I talked a lot. And um, I'll stop with that, and I can answer any questions that you might have. But thank you for your time, and we are very excited. Oh, well, thank you, and, and I'm sure several of us may have, or all of us may have some questions. But just for simplicity, what we're talking about is taking the service that we have today, but offering a new provider using fiber. So, uh, exactly. yeah, good. And so, and obviously, that provides the competition that you, you had mentioned. Yeah. Any other questions? Not right. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Several questions for clarification. Uh, in there's a, a lot of investment required. Uh, where's the money coming from, and it, is it using any uh, local uh, community bonds that might take up some of that Great capacity? Question. I know we get that question a lot, and that might have been one of the first questions from city leadership. We're not asking for any money from you. Um, I think that's an important part. You will often hear these pitches, and there, that is involved. That's not ours. Um, we, we have cash on the balance sheet to do this uh, project. Uh, we, we are a very conservatively financed company. We could borrow some extra money under our existing credit facility if we needed to, but we have cash on the balance sheet to do this project. There will be no financial commitment. What I would say, though, is even more important than money to us is the time and attention um, of, of, of the city leadership. We've already gotten that, but there's going to be a lot more involved in this and the communication, the Q&A. When we go through public rights away, um, especially public rights away that maybe haven't been touched in a while, it generates lots of questions from people. And we're not always going to be perfect anytime you do something new. You're, you're not, and so, but we'll resolve questions, we'll escalate them, we'll get them fixed. But the front end project plan is critical and then as we work through this project is going to be very, very important. But that's all we're asking but I don't want to minimize that. There is going to be time. No one's set up to handle, you know, 4,000 plus permits <laughs> on something like this uh, or whatever might be involved. And, and so we're going to need to work through and think collaboratively about how, how, we, how we do that. On the, yeah, thank you. On the reliability question, uh, so what I've noticed with, with Cox, the reliability is if we have a, a you know, big storm and the power fluctuates, even though there's a generator within like 200 feet, of, of my house, I'll lose the internet and then it'll take a while to come back out. Uh, whereas we've got a pilot with Verizon and that's not happening. Where's the weakest link in terms of your system? Um, 
you know, I, I would say the Verizon pilot might be wireless. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so in, the, in a cable network, there are lots of what are called active components throughout the network that, um, you know, uh, do require power and sometimes are tied directly to generators and sometimes they're not. But that power fluctuation, when it's an active component, causes problems. That's your cable network. Our, our network, if you can think about on two opposite ends, just light signaling back and forth. There's, there's really nothing in the middle. And, and so as the light signals back and forth, we, we've got those tied in to power generators. Um, and that's in layman's terms, and I do more regulatory than technology, but that is the reliability factor. We're still going to have an issue if a tree falls across a line. I mean, fiber cuts are fiber cuts. Uh, but, but we don't have the cascading effect of active, active uh, components throughout the network. We, we really just have that light flashing across the network. Now, in terms of pricing, I appreciate in the, in the package you actually showed yeah. your pricing. Um, is, that, is that specifically uh, sort of the marketing put that together for this area, or is it, is it an existing statewide? That, that's schedule? statewide. Uh, thank you for... Um, bringing that up. So uh, we have standardized pricing. Uh, there are discounts. You can just buy internet from us. There are discounts if you buy more than one service of approximately $10 uh, or more, but if, if you buy more than one service from us. Um, the, we have, we have a, obviously a, a launched website where you can see all of this and there's more details. One thing I'd say about this is on the internet side, uh, the world is dynamic right now. It's evolving. So we're probably going to offer some lower end tiers. And even before that, what we have been approved across the state of Virginia through the federal government is we have a low cost internet product that takes $50 off of any of the internet packages if you qualify. And that would be low income or student pricing. So that's, um, it's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. So you could take 50 bucks off that. So that's not everything. I, I, this is a good placeholder for me when I, I'd like to say that um, this, this is where we are right now. Um, you know, Cox n knows this because they've seen it in Roanoke. Um, I, I think the incumbent will start, to, um, you know, start to do some different stuff probably with their pricing. And, now, from a marketing standpoint, we, might you have introductory pricing for so many months, and is there an installation fee? All right. We haven't done introductory pricing uh, yet. We, we like the simple bill approach. There's, there's not you know, lots of extra fee. That's the approach philosophy we've taken. Um, we uh, do some discounted install fees um, for that, especially if we've got our truck we're doing install and we catch people there. Uh, the, we, we do we do uh, some of that, but um, yeah. So the short answer is we're we're not doing intro um, uh, pricing right now. It is what it is. This is a, a great service, and we provide great customer service. That's the other piece of this. People, uh, we've really found enjoy interacting with us. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Um, so thank you for the the presentation. And as an old school. Um, non-tech person, I'm going to ask some questions that some of our audience might be interested in. So when you say vocal phone, that's what we would just consider like a landline, correct? It is. And when you show these various packages, locals, entertain, delight, I assume that that's similar to our incumbent where you would pick based on what you, what you might want. For instance, I want ESPN, so I have to go to a bigger package just to get that one sports channel. That's right, and that would be in our entertain. And I wish we had more control, but Disney owns ESPN. They tell us where we have to package that. That's the we're not at a la carte. We can't on our video piece. We can't really do anything different than than Cox is doing with okay. their videos. Okay. And one question I had was why a better reliability, and Mr. Maslin already asked that. And then the purchase plan, it looks like you do buy MBPSs, whatever they are, uh, for the Internet. Um, oh. So there are some choices there, I see. Right. And just to understand, cable currently goes underground, and your fiber would go underground, correct? That's a great question. So 
what we do and what we always commit to is we want to follow the path of power. So if your power is already underground, we're, we're going underground. If it's aerial, we want to stay aerial, and there's some reasons to that because eventually you, you may say this area of the city, it all needs to go underground. If we're already underground, it can cause some complications. So um, think of power. If there's already a power line running aerial, we'll be right up next beside it. And how power enters the house will also follow. If it, it could be aerial down the street, but then the, what we call the drop. If it comes off and goes underground, we'll come off that pole and go underground into the house, however power is going. If we don't want to create any aesthetic burdens, you know, um, and but we'll also follow in the future, you may have some, uh, not revitalization, but you know, uh, some programs where you do want to underground stuff and we have to follow once you bring power down. So that's a, a perfect example for the street that I live on because I'm currently um, aerial and there is a plan to put all the wiring underground. So once that would occur, then you all would mirror that and put it underground. And that's some of the communication that we're going to begin to have with your public works group to understand all those areas and put it into our plans and figure, figure it all out. And when you're talking about putting it underground, it's not a big trench or something where you're going to come in and dig up someone's yard. Can you explain sort of in layman's terms, the process you use to get that wire underground? It, it, while it's a small wire in a, in a conduit about this big, I mean, the wire that is actually going into someone's house is the diameter of your hair, believe it or not. Um, wow. We're, we're going to need to get to every house, and actually we, we will get the homeowner's improve, uh, approval before we do this, but drill into the wall. We bring the fiber all the way into the house. Um, but let's, let, let's talk about the, the right-of-way. Um, we do get questions uh, for Ariel. Most most of the time, the questions are just curiosity and excitement. They see they see our work. We have people in bucket trucks. They, you know, pe people know what's happening. When, when we are doing any kind of buried work and trenching, um, it does create more questions from citizens. Many times, uh, from my perspective, people feel like that public right of way is their property especially if it hasn't been touched in a while. Sometimes um, we'll also need to um, touch trees up to get out of the public. But again, we work through the, the city, and, but, but you know, anytime you touch a tree in, in someone or around someone's yard, that's gonna generate a question. Uh, but there's certain rules we have to follow before we can put, uh, put our power up. But without question, uh, an example that I would tell you, um, we, we, we have a series of door hangers that start 90 days before we do anything. What we often find, and, and so we hit it, we do a mailer, but we're putting stuff on people's doorknobs. Uh, 90 days, 60 days, 30 days. The week of, um, and you'll see painting, that's the marking uh, you know, that needs to be have misutility. Uh, the week of, we'll have people door knocking, trying to make sure we talk to everybody, and many times people haven't looked at their door hangers, you know, surprisingly. Uh, but, you know, in that conversation, um, we'll still have, we spoke uh, to, to one person in the house, but they didn't relay the message that next morning when we're digging, sometimes we have to hand dig a trench down that, you know, it could be this and there'll be a pile of dirt. People get upset. They have questions. We'll fix it. Uh, but, but that's some of, to give you some flavor, by the next day or by the end of the day, it's all covered over, it's reseeded, but there's some disruption with this. But it's not as large as some people might assume um, that it would be to, to put a cable that's in right, underneath. That's right, that's right. So how long has Harrisonburg had this um, program? Two, two plus years. Okay, because I'm from Dayton. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I was just curious how far it stretched outside of Harrisonburg. We're going to do Dayton. We just got approval, and that that'll start. It'll start later this year, but we had to get a similar agreement for the town of Dayton. And uh, well, good. My sister will be excited. So, thank you. Thank That's you. all thank the questions, questions I had. Thanks for this detailed presentation, Alex. It, it really helps, and I'm excited for the um, potential for there to be competition in Williamsburg for our fiber. 
you, know, you mentioned you were in regulation and the way our electric utilities are laid out is they can't geographically expand and so within their area it's monopoly and, and it's been that way with Cox and Williamsburg and I know there are some folks that have really looked forward to having a competitive bid. So I'm excited for you all to be here in the city. I have two questions. I'm going to try to show a visual here. I can never see that all too well so I hope this is uh, viewable. But this is where there will be the build out of nodes within the city around the Griffin Avenue area and the Highland Park area. Could you speak towards the physical changes and, and what exactly is going in there? Okay, so those first two ovals we just identified as that's where we're going to go first. That's all that's represented, and we wanted to put some streets there. And so um, we'll, we'll focus our efforts there, but as you can imagine, our, our world is about connecting those ovals and build, we're going to build a ring around. We don't quite have the ring fully designed yet um, but you know that what you'll see is just an expansion of us growing out so I think your question is what inside of those red ovals will happen mostly what would potentially be the disruption there are you all installing equipment or, or is these just saying this is the very beginning of your work and very you beginning of the work okay. now all right I, so we will need to identify a uh, op site that's a point of presence where our Equipment <clears throat> will need to go, and that that'll be in a hardened build, building. Won't be in those ovals. It'll be in a hardened oval, a hardened um, building that's maybe 20 feet by 30 feet, and it has lots of computer signaling equipment. We're not sure whether we put that in the city limits or maybe somewhere like James City County, something like that. But there will be, all right, there will be um, fiber connectivity, uh, period. And so the the fiber conduit, whether it's aerial or buried. You uh, may see what we call handholds, and those are little green pedestals along the way. If, so as, if we're buried, you'll see this, you know, every so often um, there'll be something like this in the ground, and it will allow us to split off and go to the Okay. And, but, it, you know, most of them, what we're doing right now, are flush with the ground. Uh, the worst case, you might see something like this that sets up or something like that, but we have to get all this approved through your zoning. Okay. And that some was, green, just some green. Uh, I can kind of picture them and see them. That was my question. From the physical landscape, what would be the change there since most is, is underground? Um, the last question was your sales process. I know you said within two years you're expected to have exposure around the city. How will you let potential customers know that they now have the option? As It's not everyone that watches council meetings and will know <laughs> Chantel's coming to town. Yeah, um, unfortunately, you'd, you'd like, yeah. Indeed. <laughs> um, there, there will be uh, a variety. So we'll do mail, direct mail, but not everybody reads uh, direct mail. These door hangers, you know, one, we, we want to get out and talk to people as we're going down their road. But, but the back side of it is always, this is what this is about, and you can go to this website to find more. Um, so we have, the, we have this website. Um, you know, in other markets, there's been some, ma call it mass media stuff, a billboard or something like that. I'm not sure here in Williamsburg, but without question, in this new world we live in, we get an awful lot of traction through digital ads and talking about this. And so what happens is we'll have trucks running around that are, these blue, purple colors seem to play pretty well with getting people's attention. And as the construction happens, people will go to the website and then you'll start, we'll launch some digital ad things that will drive people and, and people will start doing pre signups okay. with us. But that, that's where we get most of it. And does that uh, significantly ramp up a year out from completion date? Um, so, you know, six months, nine months, we'll start construction uh, with, within a year you're going to see us, you're going to start to see glow in this. You're going to see our trucks around, and it starts driving questions. So, you know, if, if you're saying a mass, your question was maybe full mass media advertising, um, yes, yeah, so certainly within, you know, by that one-year mark from approval date, you're going to start seeing mass media. I can come back, and we always like to share ahead of time before we do stuff. So, you know, we never want... Um, yeah, you to be the last to know of something that's going to happen. But, but, but call it a year. You'll start okay. seeing mass meeting. Great. That's a quick timeline. So I'm looking forward to support. Those are all my questions. One other question for me, and I know Vice Mayor Dent has another. Once you land the fiber into the house, currently we have boxes at every different TV. Right. How does the service 
communicate once it lands in the house to the rest of the house. I, I used to have a slide on this and I took it out. So we bring it in and we have um, we're, we're, the platform we're utilizing right now is called Eero. It's a white router uh, that, that we really like. Uh, that router, once it's inside, you can continue to stay fiber if you want. It has ethernet jacks that you can pull off of that, but it's a very powerful wireless router. And um, so, so I have, I'm biased, but I have this in my house and my cable TV is all wireless. So I don't have to deal with it. And that's been one of the best benefits of this. I can move them around, I can do whatever I want. Uh, and I never ha quite had them right. So I always had that black wire running across the floor. Um, so it, it's all dealt wirelessly and there's no large cable box anymore. That used to be a, a big issue and we still have that in our legacy plant. Um, you can get things, uh, you can get it a couple of different ways from us for the video. We, we do have a small box that's about this big that again is served wirelessly or the Amazon Fire Stick is what many people are going for right now. We have an app called Glow Fiber on the Amazon Fire Stick. And if you're a customer, you download and you watch all your cable that way. Thank you. Dan? I had a question more along the lines of marketing and you've talked about these other areas where you've gone in to compete against the incumbent. Um, Obviously, this may the incumbent may begin to lower prices. That's right. Um, so, so when that happens, what's the what do you think is the key selling point, the foundation for your company to say, regardless if they're if they're beating our price, this is what that's right we provide. So, I, you know, I think in, in in business terms, we think about differentiation and not competing just on price. And so, this technology has benefits and, and while I think some part of the market will react and, and move to the lower prices, we get that. Um, certainly, I think this, the university students have left now. We, we think that this will play well uh, for people that are intensive user, users of bandwidth. Um, uh, but I, So we're gonna differentiate. We're gonna differentiate based on technology and, and then how we interact with the customer and that gets to customer service. Now, long term in 10 years, uh, 10 years from now, you know, what's the crystal ball? I, you know, I've, I've been in business a long, a long time. I, I, I wouldn't say w we can say we're completely immune to price competition, but, but at least right now what we're doing in Roanoke, what we're doing in Lynchburg, which are very large markets, um, we're, that's where we're focused and we're still having very good success and traction. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate your presentation. I think it was very helpful for us to hear and as well as everybody that's watching. So it's good information. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, and thank you to uh, city leadership. And, and we look forward to working with you. Turn to Chris. I guess she has to tell us about the agreement. So the agreement is essentially the same agreement as the Cox agreement <clears throat> with a few changes because they have not built out their network and they have to install it. That was not an issue when council adopted the Cox franchise agreement. There is a requirement in the Code of Virginia that there be parity between these cable companies that operate. And so, for example, if we provided a cable franchise agreement that was significantly less strenuous than Cox, Cox could opt to, to include themselves in that agreement, basically to transfer those terms to the Cox agreement. And so there's a requirement that these be in parity with each other. And so we started with the Cox agreement. So all of the terms, and are more or less the same as Cox, except for the build-out terms. The build-out terms are they have to have the initial build-out done within 24 months, and they have to have the build-out of the city in 48 months from the date of the franchise agreement. So it's a pretty quick turnaround time. The agreement contains the map that Mr. Rogers showed um, where the initial build-out will happen, and it will go from there. They're required to obtain right-of-way permits just like Cox is. So basically, this is an agreement to allow them to put their wires into the city's uh, streets and rights of ways. Their customer service standards, they're the same as the Cox customer service standards, except that for their build-out period, they do have a little bit of flexibility for those things that are not commercially reasonable, like having an office in the city of Williamsburg. Cox is required to have an office within 10 miles of the city of Williamsburg. So more or less the same agreement that we have with Cox, um, requirement that they provide peg channels, a requirement that everywhere we have wires underground, they have to go underground, a requirement that they may not put wires overground in the historic area. Can happy, happy to answer any other questions that you may have. I don't have any questions. 
Do we have, let me, I do have one question. Are there, do we have any other agreements uh, proposed to us to, to view today? We have not received any other bids. Okay, Good. thank you. Okay, with that, I will open the public hearing, which again is an opportunity for anybody in the audience to come forward. And for anyone to present any bids they may have here. Thank you. I was just getting ready to say that. If anybody would like to come forward and present a competing offer, that'd be great. Okay, seeing none, I'll close that public <coughs> hearing and, and turn back to council for comments and consideration of the mo motion. Yeah, um, I just want to say thanks to Mr. Barham for working on this agreement. I think, um, as was mentioned in the presentation, um, consumers want alternatives, and um, this is a seems like a very viable alternative, um, and it brings along with it the other things that were mentioned, creating some local jobs, um, and I guess, you know, we. We all have our own opinions of the incumbent, but right now it's about providing an alternative and, those, and the members of the community can choose uh, which service that they, they want as a provider. So um, I think it's a great thing and, and I support this agreement. I, I agree with the vice mayor and I think maybe planning is gonna have to open up more uh, opportunities for county residents to move into the city. Uh, thank you. I just have, have one question. Um, you mentioned that, a, as I understand it, approval would have to be given by the homeowner to, to run the lines or the fiber into the home. Um, so if you have a, a rental population in a home that really wants this service, it would be up to the owner, though, to, to give allowance for the fiber to be run to the home, is that correct? Yeah, just a little bit, because yeah, we do have some areas where there's significant rental population. We want to get, and we've done a good job getting to the majority of, we call them MDUs, multi-dwelling uh, units, multi-tenant dwelling units, uh, in other areas, but they do require a different agreement. Thank you so much for bringing that up. We, we believe there are about 500 or so in this area from our initial analysis. We will need to get uh, separate agreements to get on their property. We don't have the same rights to kind of just barge right through and, and hook up the renters. But we, we do have a program for that. It's important to us. We, have, we just have business natural business drivers that makes us want to do that. We'll, we'll update the city as we go along, but, but it, it will follow a, a different process. We're going to pull in front of all of them, and then it's just a matter of us connecting. We think, and what we've seen is it also makes for better rentability of the properties. So the, 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 the owners of these places want, uh, want this also. But. Yes, I, I would uh, agree. We just do have uh, a number of, of landlords that don't live in the city, and so sometimes, you know, just reaching them, and I was curious about the process. That's one piece that may take us a little bit longer, and so, yes. So thank you. That's the only other question. I have no final thoughts. Thank you for the presentation again and for your work, Mr. Barham. Yeah, thank you for all your effort, uh, Mr. Barham. Well, I think it's, you know, high time that we provide this opportunity to our residents. I think, you know, a lot of people have talked about the inability to to use any other service provider other than the one that we have, and that's a, a, sor a, a, a source of consternation for a lot of folks. And so this, this opportunity to bring uh, Chantel in um, to offer this competition, I think, is, is really a good thing for our citizens and our businesses. And so I welcome this opportunity, particularly as it's going to be done at their expense. <laughs> is there a motion? So I move that City Council grant Shenandoah Cable Television LLC a franchise to provide cable television and broadband services within the city and authorize the city manager to execute the attached cable television franchise agreement with Shentel Cable Television LLC. Second. Trivet. So I have that Ms. Ramsey made the motion and Mr. Rogers was the second. Chair, we call the roll. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Ms. Ramsey? Aye. Mayor Pons? Aye. Vice Mayor Dent? Aye. Mr. Maslin? Aye. Thank you. So that takes us to item B, uh, consideration and approval of resolution 21-18, approving the acceptance of the Corona State, Coronavirus State and Local Recovery Fund 
uh, allocated part of the American Rescue Plan Act and establishing the ARPA fund as a new city fund within the city budget. Ms. Stammer. Uh, good afternoon. The city of Williamsburg was awarded $18,419,663 in coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds established by the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. We will receive the funds in two tranches. We've already received the first half of $9,200,000, and we anticipate receiving the second half in June or, or July of 20, 2022. Resolution 2118 requests City Council appropriate the entire $18.4 million uh, for planning purposes. Uh, we're aware we just need to be um, mindful of cash flow because we have the first 9.2 million in hand. Uh, we know that we will be receiving the other 9.2, so as we plan, we need to keep that in mind. Uh, we're also requesting the establishment of the American Rescue Plan Act fund. We feel that having a separate fund to track expend expenditures and to um, also for reporting purposes would be prudent and that this fund or the appropriations to this fund would be deemed to be on a continuing basis meaning that the funds would uh, appropriations would carry forward from year to year uh, and as you're aware we have until december 31st of 2024 to expect to expand or commit the funds until to december 31st 2026 to complete the projects and have all expenditures completed uh, for now the uh, appropriation would be to fund balance and then we would come back to council and ask for appropriation to specific projects once that planning has been done um, and so that um, basically is what we're requesting. I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Ms. Dameron. So just so everybody's clear, this is just receiving the money, not designating the funds. This is correct. This is just appropriating what we have received and what we plan to receive. Mr. Trivet, could you, could you just remind everyone about your vision for what we discussed with the committee? Absolutely. So um, at the last meeting, I think last month, we talked about a process for planning how we would invest the funds that we're receiving. And it included a staff list of suggestions, which would be a jumping off point. I think we're up to about 25 ideas so far on that list. And then a, a steering committee will be formed. And that committee will meet this month to review those ideas and pare it down, add two, but paring it down to 12 that will go out to the public as part of a survey process in October. And then in November, the city council will meet in a um, retreat type format, similar to what we do when we do strategic planning to decide the final investment strategy. So we're, we're still a long ways away from determining exactly what we'll spend the money on. Thank you. And I, I just thought it was important to remind everybody what, what the process is going to be to, to designate how the funds would be used. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks. I think this is a good opportunity just to remind our, our residents uh, how lucky we, how fortunate we are to be getting this extent of funds. Um, it's, it's fortunate that we're in a corporate city and that we're within the Commonwealth of Virginia because, uh, we're, as most people know, Virginia is the only state where we don't report to a county. Uh, so the funds coming down from the federal government are not diluted before they get to us. And the extent of our funds are actually more than some towns bigger than us and counties bigger than us. Correct. And, and that is because we got two components. Both uh, one is they termed a county, even uh, just because of the confusion between independent cities. And then one is a non-entitlement unit. Thank you. I think I just... Uh, to focus on that point of us being fortunate. I think Williamsburg is extremely fortunate for the planning that they've done that led us up to now. 
because we find ourselves in a very different situation than a lot of communities in the state in that we don't have extreme and certain and immediate needs in infrastructure to spend this money on, which gives us the opportunity to invest it rather than spend it. Well, and, that, and that's um, what I was going to say, too, that I think it's very important to keep the integrity of these funds whole because we do recognize this as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make transformative um, investments for the city. So I'm all in favor of creating this new fund. And as am I, I was only going to reiterate for anyone listening in that there will be an opportunity for public comment in October and then again in November before council decides. So without a doubt, there will be the considerations from the public about what to do with this uh, windfall of funding. So thank you. I appreciate the recommendation to create a fund separate from just putting the money in the general fund uh, for the appropriate measures of accounting for the inflows and outflows of the fund, just like we do with the tourism development fund now with our education. Um, so that makes perfect sense, and I'm glad we're, we're going to take this step. So this is a public hearing. So with that, I'm sorry we kind of got ahead okay. of ourselves. Yep. So I'd like to open the public hearing to anybody in the audience who'd like to come forward and speak to this. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and come back to council for a motion. So I move that city council adopt resolution number 21-18 to accept the CSLRF funds and establish a new fund in the city's budget for ARPA funds and subsequent appropriations. Second. Mr. Trivet. I have that uh, Councilwoman Ramsey made the motion and Vice Mayor Dent was the second. Sarah, call the roll. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Ms. Ramsey? Aye. Mayor Pons? Aye. Vice Mayor Dent? Aye. Mr. Maslin? Aye. Thank you. <clears throat> so that takes us to item C, consideration and, uh, and approval of resolution 21-19, establishing a residential and small business real estate tax relief program and amending the American Rescue Plan Fund for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2022. Stammer. I see you in the wings. Yeah. Council had requested when we passed the budget um, for us to consider use of American Rescue Plan funds to grant real estate tax relief uh, or a program for that for the ec those impacted economically by COVID-19. Uh, the proposed resolution 21-19 uh, establishes a residential and small business real estate tax relief program. With residents, uh, we are re el for eligibility, we request proof of primary residence, a 20% a reduction in income due to COVID-19, and that their income levels fall um, at or below 80% of the median income is determined by HUD. With small businesses, we define a small business is one with fewer than 20 full-time equivalent positions at any time during the COVID emergency. And those dates range between March 13th, 2020 and June 30th, 2021. And we also ask for evidence of a 20% reduction in gross receipts between uh, January 1st and December 31st of 2020 compared to January 1 through December 31st of 2019. Um, the eligibility re requirements were designed to be in line with the requirements of the American Rescue Plan uh, Fund Act. We're asking for 750,000 for um, program and another 37,500 to be available for administrative expenses and that any unused portion will re revert back to the fund balance of the ARPA fund and be available uh, for any other investments that council would uh, like to consider. Um, and so staff recommends that city council approve resolution 21-19, establishing the res residential and small business real estate tax relief program. Thank you, Ms. Dameron. So just as a reminder, as we were going through the uh, budget process in consideration of a 
a real estate tax increase. Um, there are some folks that came forward and, and stated, you know, that uh, how they've been impacted economically by the, the virus and I think council was all in an agreement that we wanted to be mindful of that impact on some of these folks and, and create this fund which falls within the guidelines of the ARPA Funds Act um, to help offset that increase. And so, um, as Ms. Dameron's outlined, there's um, currently some guidelines that would have to be met and I look forward to hearing from council if they need to be amended uh, more liberally, certainly something I'd be happy to consider with you all, um, that any increase in tax would be offset by applying to the city um, and, and being able to take advantage of these funds. So essentially, there will be a no tax increase for those people that qualify should they apply for these funds. Correct, and, and the way that we would measure that would uh, essentially the um, grant would be for 4% of the real estate assessment divided by uh, 100, per 100. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't have any questions, Vice Mayor, do you? No, I don't have any questions. I just appreciate you putting the program uh, together. And as the mayor mentioned, I think it's an excellent use of the funds that we, um, you know, we show a good faith effort to try to help those folks that, have, that came forward and said they were hurt. Um, you know, by coronavirus and, and how it affected their, their families and their businesses. And it just gives us another opportunity um, to support those folks in the community. Um, so I, I assume that like many of the other grant programs, other than what you've mentioned, is it's going to be a very, it's not going to be a cumbersome process um, we for people to go through to, to request the relief. That's a good question, and we've worked um, very hard both with the Human Services and our Economic Development Department because the Human Services would be handling the application for residential and the Economic Development Department would be handling the application for tourism. And so we're trying to make that a uh, streamline that application process, keeping in mind that there are certain criteria that we have to cover to be um, within the guidelines. Yeah, so thanks to all the staff that was involved in making this possible, really important. Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I think there are two areas where I'd like to maybe just suggest we look at the language uh, to make sure we're in sync with the intent. Uh, one of which is uh, there's the looking at the uh, adjusted gross income. It says for two years. Um, could we say that if it meets the criteria for one of those two years rather than both of those years? Well, what we're, we're lo really looking at 2020, but we're measuring compared to two okay. 2019 is what we're so doing. So just one year. So one, just one, one year, year. correct. The second one was uh, in terms of accepting applications until November 30th or until the funds run out. I think that rather than, some people might interpret that as it may take two years for the funds to run out. Can we say the, whichever comes first. Yes, that, that is a, a good, I think the thought process was until November 30th, should the funds run out earlier. So first is an important word in there, right? right. So um, maybe keep that in, in mind if you choose to approve it, that we modify, make it Does administrative. Make yeah, I, listen, I, I think there might be uh, another suggestion to amend this resolution. And so what we'll do is we'll consider the motion to approve the resolution to include those amendments. Thank you. So I don't have any any questions. And uh, as Mr. Trivett said, I think there's a couple other um, modifications. And I'm going to let Caleb present those. Sure. Um, so two quick questions and then a comment, Director Damren. First is, I, I'd ask the representative from Chantel about their sales process. And you'd mentioned that our, our economic development team and our uh, team from Human Services is working hard to make sure that the folks they work with will be aware of this. So what is our sort of marketing process up until that November 30th deadline so that we're making sure to get the word out about this relief grant? Well, certainly. Uh, we plan, if this is passed, to start taking applications Monday. So certainly that application would be available online. And then we would work with our public information officer to make sure that we get word out in multiple um, 
avenues to make sure that the public and the businesses are aware. Yeah, I, I spoke with uh, Nicole before the meeting, and, and she's planning to do some, some social media stuff today, um, as well as the potential of a press release in the, in the next day or two concerning this. So we'll start pushing it out. In addition to that, because uh, we're working with Economic Development and Human Services on this program, they already have a list of people that they work with regularly, economic development from previous grant opportunities and human services just from working with their service clients day in, day out. Um, so it's easy for us to make those right. personal contacts and let them know. That's great. I, I like that, you know, the approach, making sure it's, it's going where it needs to. Um, and Nicole, I know we're CC'd on, on all press releases, so I'll, I'll be on the lookout for that as we all have our, our own sort of personal networks to spread that to. Um, my, my recommendation was there's two parts of this, the residential side and, and then the business side. And for the particular side on the residential, the qualifications are if you're living 80% of the median income and can demonstrate from 2019 a 20% reduction of income, then you would be eligible for this relief grant. And as I see it, if you're owning a home in Williamsburg, already living at 80%, um, really no matter who you are, but especially if you fall into that bucket, a fifth reduction in your income, a 20% reduction, would be devastating. And because we have such a, uh, an amount allocated to this, truly if 100% of the eligible people and businesses were to apply, we would reach that 750 allocated, then I'd like to make it a little easier for someone to, to be eligible, a resident, should they show a 10% reduction in income while still living at 80% of the AMI that they would then be eligible for this relief grant. And so that's what I recommend is my change. I think it also makes a lot of sense to textually change it so that the deadline is November 30th or when the funds are expended, whichever comes sooner. Uh, and I will uh, motion, well, I'll suggest that to council for their comments. So I have no, no quorums with that. I, I think, you know, I think what we're alloc the, the amount that we're allocating is, is Substantial enough that it may cover whatever that, that delta variance may be, um, and so I think it, the more liberal we can make it for the, those people in need is fine with me. I I would agree. Well, that, Set, yeah, that, that, I'd say, yeah, that was my question. It sounds like there is a good plan in place to communicate this relief grant, and um, hopefully that'll that'll allow however much the ability for maybe a few more people to be eligible as a 10% reduction of income can still also be very difficult. Yes, any other comments before I go to public hearing? Thank you, Ms. Dameron. So with that, I'll open up the public hearing. And again, if anybody would like to come forward and speak to this, please come forward and state your name and address. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and come back to council for further conversation. Consideration, motion, we'll let Caleb or Mr. Rogers deliver. I may help with the language here, um, but I will, uh, I recommend the adoption of resolution number 21-19 with the provisions that there will be a text change to say the deadline is. Yeah, I think what we'll say is uh, that the program will expire on November the 30th or as the funds are exhausted, whichever may come first. Right. And then I think you wanted to lower the income threshold to 10%. Right, including the, the demonstration of a 10% reduction of income for those at 80% of the AMI. We need to restate that? No, I think we've got it. Okay. I wasn't going to be able to remember all of it. So. <laughs> Second. All right. I have that uh, Mr. Rogers made the motion and Ms. Ramsey was the second. Sarah? Mr. Rogers? Aye. Ms. Ramsey? Aye. Mayor Pons? Aye. Vice Mayor Dent? Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. Thank you for all for doing that. Um, so that takes us to reports. And first, we have monthly financial statement. Cameron, welcome. Okay, new year, new report. Um, and since this is new, I'd like to take just a few minutes to talk about what we're showing and what's in each column. Um, so we're um, showing our revenue, our major revenue streams, and those specifically are real estate tax, personal property tax, business, professional, and occupational license tax, and we commonly refer to that as BPOL, lodging tax, meals tax. Now, those first five are in the general fund. 
And then we also thought it was important to report on sales tax, tourism sales tax, and the $2 lodging tax. The next column is our FY19 August year to date actual numbers. So that's at this point in time what we had received in 19, fiscal 19. We thought that was important because that was the last full year before we experienced COVID and the impact of COVID on our revenues. The next column shows our pre pandemic uh, FY22 projection. Uh, it, that projection is based on what we would have anticipated that rev those revenue streams being had COVID not occurred. So we were looking as a starting point at FY20 before how we were trending before COVID hit. And then we were looking at um, our natural growth rates for 21 and then 22. And then this is what we would anticipate it um, receiving as of August year to date. Had, uh, in that situation. The next column is our adopted FY22 budget for these revenue streams. The next column is what we would, based on the FY22 budget, where we would anticipate being based on historical trends as of August um, 2021 year to date. The next is our August actual year to date. The next column is the percent of actual um, revenue above or below the projection for August year to date. And the final two columns speak to what we anticipate, uh, where we anticipate being at year end and what the sur resulting surplus of deficit would be. And each one of those right now has a to be determined because frankly we just don't have enough trend data yet um, to be forecasting that. So uh, at that point, Looking at August year to date, um, real estate tax, we didn't project that we would receive any as of August, and we haven't, so it's a zero variance there. On personal property tax, we anticipated receiving 51,000. We actually received about 39,000. So we are below the projection by 24%, not at all concerned about that at this point in time because obviously I'm using trend data to project where I would anticipate being. Um, that does fluctuate and also those are relatively no, low numbers because we don't anticipate that to revenue stream to grow until closer to the due date in December and lower numbers often produce a higher um, variance. Our B poll, we anticipated receiving about $6,000. We have actually received 12, and we're then about 110% above the uh, projection. Our lodging tax, we projected we would receive about $205,000. We've actually received close to $404,000, and that's 97% above uh, what we projected. Mills tax, we had projected right at half a million. We actually received seven, about almost 762,000, and that is 52% above our projection. Sales tax and tourism, we will not have uh, July information on that until later this month. And then the $2 lodging tax, we uh, projected receiving close to 79,000. We actually received 106, and that's about 35% above our projection. Um, we, if I look just at the general fund and these variances, I would be um, about a hundred thousand. I'm sorry, about four hundred and fifty thousand above each one of those five revenue streams that relate to the general fund, and those were real estate, personal property, B poll, lodging, and meals. And we did not show on this slide, but our other revenue streams. Um, somewhat smaller streams collectively or is of August running about 100,000 ahead of our projection. So our total revenues at this point are about um, 500,000 ahead of, the, of our projection. Our expenditures are in line with budget. And if I were to uh, look at where I would expect to be compared to where we actually are, I would be um, about $600,000 lower than projected. 
So that means at this point in time, we are about 1.2 million ahead of where I would project to be, just based on historical cash flow. Um, and that would leave us with a deficit or a draw from, from balance at this point of about 4.4 million. And you can see that on your report on page two, that would be um, next to the last line from the bottom and the column, the August year to date column. And if you look at that line for FY21 and FY20, that's shown on the report, you would see that that's in line with what we've experienced for both of those years as of August. And since we um, like to use FY19 as our base year, I look back to see what we were doing in August of 2018, which would be in the FY19 uh, fiscal year. And in that year, we had pulled about $5.1 million from fund balance. Uh, and typically, we see larger draws early in the year because we haven't gotten some of our revenue streams in. Um, and I will also report, I think last year I had mentioned that our water and sewer revenue streams were, were um, down, and as was consumption. And I'm happy to report that we're seeing both those revenue streams um, increase and the consumption is increasing in uh, in line with what we're seeing in revenue. Um, and that concludes my formal report. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Good. Well, thank you, Ms. Dameron. Um, I think I like the new report better. A um, little, little easier to follow and look forward to kind of seeing how it starts to work out once the numbers start to come in. Uh, just looking at the monthly financials, um, I was pleased to see that for both room and meals tax, July's activity was as high as it's almost been, except with the uh, rooms was down slightly compared to 2018, but um, those are fantastic numbers. Right. Uh, but I would caution, you know, as we go into the fall and, and with the Delta variant, I don't think we're going to see that, that type of number continue to be equal to those 2018, 2019. So I think we're going to experience some dip, but I hope not. But I don't have any other questions, but Vice Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Dameron, and I, I too like the, it, it's easier to follow this report, um, but, but you've always done a good job of explaining it, and obviously there's some positive numbers there, and, and I, looking at uh, room and meal tax, as the mayor mentioned, I noticed that we were equal or, or above 2018 numbers, which was encouraging, but one of the things we've talked about all along is, is that sustainable even not just with the drop off in the fall, but now we're experiencing, you know, impacts from the um, COVID variant and no one really knows where that's going. But um, again, not to, to always look on the negative side, but we have a lot of positive to be thankful for, but we still have a long way to go to recover where we were. This is true. And I think this report will help us as we move forward. Uh, thanks. Yeah, just commenting on the trending here, especially with the uh, hotels. So uh, I think that's great news in terms of lodging if we're seeing uh, that the uh, actual August 2021 is uh, more than what it was pre-pandemic or, or FY19. Uh, but and when we and I'm going to probably come back to the mayor for some expertise here. Uh, but then we look at the two-dollar lodging tax, where we're not we're not more than uh, FY19, so I think what we're seeing is the hotel rooms are getting priced more, but the occupancy just hasn't gone up more yet. And um, one of the problems I think the industry's having is, although we measure revenue per available room, uh, there's an artificial constraint on available rooms based on staffing. So we've got hotels that, like Colonial Williamsburg, has got a hotel that's not even open because they can't staff it. So would that be correct? Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, the industry has been suppressing their own demand, um, mostly because of lack of staffing. Um, but that said, I think, you know, how much more could we have pushed demand um, anyways? And, and certainly couldn't, I don't know that we could have pushed rate. Uh, so I think it was, it worked out to be a good balance between suppressing 
supply of rooms and the price increase at the AER average daily rate. Thank you. Thank you. I have no, no questions and I appreciate the comments that have already been made and I too um, like the new report style. Thank you, Director Dameron. This is helpful and, and easier to read. Similarly, as been said, it's encouraging to see the trend going in the right direction. Of course, that's in comparison to our kind of worst case scenario projection. And I think there are still very much Delta variant concerns. Uh, there's some guidance from William Mary to mask both indoor and outdoor, for instance, as an indication that that's still prevalent. But um, it's nice to see that there's been some good months of tourism as we haven't seen in a while. That's all. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so that takes us to monthly department and operating reports. I believe there was conversation about that. Yeah, I think we had a, a reporting error. Mark, did you want to talk about that? There was several reporting errors this month on the specifically on the community character, the financial uh, aspects of those particular metrics. Uh, we've since had those corrected uh, on that particular report. There was one. Um, that I'll call a fat finger mistake on my part that, uh, that we've since corrected, uh, as well as just some others. So it, it was certainly not a banner month for, uh, for um, the public dashboard, but, but all of those that were identified either by council members or other staff, as well as uh, myself going through the entire, all of the reports and finding any other issues, I believe we've corrected everything. That's good, thank you. Questions or comments? I had several questions, but department heads were able to answer them before the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Hearing other, we'll move over to city manager's report. Mr. Trivet, anything? The only thing that I would say is, again, about departmental reports, and I, I told you all this during our briefing discussions, um, the staff's been working diligently for quite some time now redesigning the dashboard to include not only our typical performance measures, but also what we're redefining as key performance indicators, more closely linked to the goals, initiatives, and outcomes. And, and we're hoping to have that ready very soon, probably um, sooner than needs to be. But we, what we plan to do is present all of that, the revised dashboard and that content to you when we do the midterm report for the goals, initiatives, and outcomes in December, January timeframe. Thank you. The attorney's report? Nothing under this item. Okay, thank you. So that takes us to unfinished business, consideration and approval of PCR number 21-005, the 2021 comprehensive plan update and future land use map. Ms. Murphy. Yes, Mayor Pons and members of city council, planning commission and staff have been working on the comprehensive plan update since May of 2018. We've had 32 work sessions a neighborhood housing forum, a business forum, a community forum, two meetings with the Economic Development Authority. And through all of that, in uh, June of this year, Planning Commission had the first public hearing on the comprehensive plan update. And in July, they recommended adoption of the plan to City Council. As you know, last month, I gave a presentation on the plan. We held our public hearing. And with that, staff's recommendation <clears throat> is to adopt the 2021 Comprehensive Plan and future land use map. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you. First, I just want to compliment you and thank you for all your efforts to do this. I um, understand this was your fourth Comprehensive Plan since you, 1999, and I know you've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and hard work, thought, and diligent thinking, and... Um, you know, we wouldn't be here today without you, so I just want to thank you. I appreciate publicly it. take a minute just to applaud you for your efforts. Um, with that, I don't have any questions. I think the uh, Planning Commission uh, has done and staff has done a great job in presenting um, you know, a, a comprehensive plan and a, and a great land use map. Um, and so I don't see any need to delay this. So with that, I'll turn it over to Vice Mayor. Yeah, I have no questions, Carolyn. Uh, thank you for your leadership getting us to the, the end, the approval of another comprehensive plan and for all the work that you've done over the years with the comprehensive plan. And I appreciate all the, uh, I asked some questions in the last meeting and appreciate your, you and staff providing those answers and I, I have no additional questions. I, I really reiterate the previous comments uh, and I don't want to steal any thunder if you're writing a book, 
<laughs> but uh, you know, looking at you know five years from now in terms of the next one, is there are any things that you would recommend in terms of sort of pivoting on approach wise? I think it you know, the affordable housing information will be important to look at. Um, you know, it's basically updating, see what's happened in those five years, see where if there's new innovations or new things that come forward that you want to include in the next update. So it's all uh, basically looking at not only the history of the city, but where do we want to take the city in the future? So you look at a combination of neighborhoods and community character and you know, parks and recreations and all those things, and there might be new innovations that uh, come forward in the next five years that we want to jump out ahead of uh, other areas and, and put it into our plan and go forward with that. So it's always thinking ahead and trying to uh, think of what the next best thing is going to be. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just like to again reiterate what my colleagues have said about your your diligence and especially like the way that uh, the comprehensive plan was presented and provided to us. I think it's much more um, easily readable, digestible by not only city council members but but the public and and residents as well. So thank you for all your hard work and and time and shepherding it through. Thank you. I'd just like to echo the notes of appreciation, Director Murphy. I know we got to work together a little on the plan when I was on the Planning Commission. And so from that, I feel like I, I saw how really you dive into the minute details, including the actual aesthetics of the plan, in, in addition to the quality of it. I remember talking about your organization of, of drone photography just to have some good pictures within the comp plan to demonstrate the, the neighborhood chapters of whichever we were on. So I really can't thank you enough for, for how substantial this is. I'll note it's, it's a labor of love. This is, of course, the 2018 plan. 2023 is coming up. I imagine it will get started soon. So uh, should you want to stick around, yeah, I imagine the work will, <laughs> will get started again. But because it is such an effort, uh, I'm glad that we were able to work together on this. And, and you very much earned the ability to, to pass it off. And I couldn't agree more with its quality. So thank you very much for all of your work. I have no further questions. OK. Well, thank you. Is there any other conversation? Motion? Well, Mayor, I was just going to say there is, there is not to be a, a killjoy, but there is one reason to delay, and that is, as you know, Ms. Murphy <laughs> has declared her intent to retire, and it's closely linked to when you adopt the comprehensive plan. <laughs> so I would make the suggestion to table this indefinitely. Okay. <laughs> well, unfortunately, the state code says we have to adopt it within 90 uh, days. Of, uh, nice try. Yeah, nice Could we start there. the next one? Actually, on that one. <laughs> well, I know Carolyn's looking forward to getting this behind her. Um, so why don't we make a motion and do that? So I move that City Council adopt the 2021 Comprehensive Plan and Future Land Use Map. And I'll second. All right, I have that Councilwoman Ramsey has made the motion and Mr. Rogers was a second. Sarah? Mr. Rogers? Aye. Ms. Ramsey? Aye. Mayor Pons? Aye. Vice Mayor Dent? Aye. Mr. Maslin? Aye. Before I leave, I would just like to say you've probably made me the happiest person in the room today. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Murphy. All right, so that takes us to new business consideration and, and approval of Resolution 21-20, amending the FY22 budget staffing list to add a, a part-time position to the Williamsburg Public Housing Authority. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just in, in brief, um, this shouldn't take but a second. A as you all know, when we adopt the city's budget, we include an FTE count in the budget document. Um, the Housing Authority staff is considered city staff, and as you approved the Housing Authority budget back in August, you approved a new part-time position, and we need to amend our FTE count in this year's budget on the city side to reflect that FTE count, and that's what this resolution does. So uh, I'll just kick it off. I, you know, I think we, we've been asking a lot of our Housing Authority staff to, to do a lot. Um, and we've, we've seen the results of that efforts, uh, both externally and, and I understand that internally our residents have better experiences. And so I can see the need um, for an additional part-time person. So 
I certainly support that. Vice Mayor? No question. No question. No questions. Okay. Is there a motion? So I move that City Council adopt um, resolution number 21-20, increasing the staff of the Williamsburg Public Housing Authority by 0.5 FTE. Second. All right, I have that Ms. Ramsey made the motion and Vice Mayor Dent was the second. Sarah? Mr. Rogers? Aye. Ms. Ramsey? Aye. Mayor Pons? Aye. Vice Mayor Dent? Aye. Mr. Maslin? Aye. Thank you. Takes us now to item B, consideration and approval of ordinance number 21-12, an ordinance to add a um, permissible solicitation time to section uh, 9-298 of the Williamsburg City Code. Shelton. Mayor and members of council, the police department has been working on revising their commercial solicitation permit process and requested that city council consider adding a time limit to those permits. So the time would begin at nine o'clock in the morning and end one hour prior to sunset with a specific designation about how that's measured in the code section. Um, so that's all this does. Um, Officer Stamper and Chief Dunn are here. If you have any questions from the police department side, it's a pretty simple amendment to the code. I agree. It seems fairly simple to me. Yeah. Straightforward. Maslin? Um, yeah, I want to thank uh, Officer Stamper and the Chief for bringing this to our attention. It, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I had a discussion with the city attorney earlier today, and it sort of enlightened me to some of the, the issues that maybe some of our residents aren't aware of. So and Chris can correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically, should the police department uh, issue the approval uh, for solicitation, it's really good in the right-of-ways in the city, um, except for if we've got a neighborhood that has private roads. Uh, and that if, if people, uh, if residents are interested in not having solicitors, they would really have to have a sign at their house saying no soliciting at which point the police could could respond. Is that is that correct? Uh, yes, sir, that's correct. The sign would have to be at a uh, reasonable place of egress or ingress, so the solicitor would have to have a really hard time not seeing it while entering the property. And then we know that the pre-qualifications for getting the permit are um, really a background check, criminal background check. It, does, the, does the program have any way to sort of gauge uh, complaints that the, they're getting from these solicitors? Uh, in terms of future approvals or, or not? Uh, yes, sir. When uh, a resident contacts the police department uh, regarding a soliciting complaint, uh, the information comes directly to me. I check the uh, information regarding who the solicitor was. Then we make contact with the solicitor regarding the nature of the complaint. Then we make a determination based on what the complaint was on whether or not the uh, solicitation application is going to be revoked or if they'll be allowed to continue solicitation or renew their solicitation at the end of 30 days. And some of uh, the questions that come from my neighbors are related to contractors trying to solicit and whether they're actually licensed contractors at all. Does, and probably a lot of those people aren't even getting permits. But if they go to a, for a permit to solicit as contractors, is that part of the check to see if they actually are licensed as a contractor? Uh, yes, sir. When they uh, come to the police department and we run a check on the individual, we also reference the business and check the business to see if it is a legitimate organization. Thank you. Uh, I have no questions. Very straightforward. Thank you. Uh, I agree. It's straightforward. I'm glad that we're putting this in place. My one question was around the sunset clause. You know, the summer sunset, I think, starts at 730, but it's still bright out then. How would sunset be considered for someone? Um, <laughs> as you all are granting permits? Uh, it's going to be based on uh, whatever the, excuse me for the terminology, the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So based on, it's, it's going to vary based on the day on what time sunset actually is. So it's not a lot of time to where sunset could be hours later. So it'll just adjust, it's just depending on the day. Okay. Right here. And Mr. Rogers, we chose to write it that way because this is still speech and it's still subject to constitutional protections. And so the restriction needs to be a reasonable time, place, and manner restriction. The issue here is making sure that when solicitors are out walking in neighborhoods that there's plenty of light, that people mm -hmm. can see them, that 
pe pedestrians and people on the roads can see them. And so there's a public safety reason behind this change. Right, and that was my curiosity. If, if it's interpreted the sunset, I wouldn't want someone to think that means when it's pitch black out. And, and when Noah would say it is, would just be when the sun starts to set. So it makes plenty of sense. Thanks. Yes, Mayor, one more question. Yes, John. Uh, are there exceptions to who needs solicitation permits like politicians? That's not considered solicitation. We have two provisions in that code section, in that chapter, commercial solicitation, which this impacts, and non-commercial solicitation, non-profit solicitation, which is really governed more by state law. So you get a permit from the State Department of Agriculture to engage in, in non-commercial solicitation. Thank you. Thank you, officer. Appreciate you coming forward. Um, I don't have any other questions. If there are any, aren't any others, is there a motion? Well, I move that City Council adopt Ordinance 21-12. A second. second. Strivet, you, were you able to catch that? It was a race. <laughs> um, so I have that Ms. Ramsey made the motion, and I'm going to go with Mr. Maslin as a second. I'll defer. All right. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Vice Mayor Dent. Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. Thank you all. So that takes us to item C, consideration of, and approval of Ordinance 21-10, an update to Article 7 of the Chapter 18 regarding transient occupancy tax to conform with the Code of Virginia. So, Mayor and members of council, um, this is an update to our room tax ordinance. Um, as I told you in the legislative update, there have been significant changes to these provisions in the Code of Virginia. There are a lot of definitions that were added to the code this year. We have incorporated those and basically rewritten the section of the city code to uh, conform with the Code of Virginia. Uh, the material point, of course, is on what amount do you pay the, real, or the room tax, and that is on the total amount paid by the customer, whether or not that is paid to a, a hotel intermediary, like Expedia, for example, um, or to the hotel itself. Um, so it it's effectively rewrites it just to be in conformity with the state code. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, so that makes perfect sense. And, you know, just as a, to help understand the nuance, a lot of times when the rate that a consumer sees on an, on an online travel uh, OTA, online travel association, is different than what actually the hotel collects. And so then what is the what is the consumer paying tax on? Are they paying on what they see on the online portal or what's being collected at the hotel? Um, oftentimes, and I think what we're, we're saying now is the tax that's collected on the online, what's visual to the consumer, all gets remitted to the to the city versus only what consumer uh, what what the hotel sees as their rate. Because there's a there's a discount that hotels offer the online travels uh, associates. So. So this is, you know, a good way for us to make sure that we're capturing all of the due sales to the city. Vice Mayor, anything? The only question I had is how do you ensure conformance to this to make sure that your Expedia or Booking.com or them are actually paying it to the city? We're going to have to work with the hotels on that. So they're going to report their gross sales and they're going to report from what they've received from the, the hotel intermediaries that's part of our auditing process okay thank you that that information is known by the hotel because when they get their reservation uh, those the different rates so a so lot of times see what now, it's been a few years since for. I've been in the hotel business but I think a lot of the OTAs have clarified you know cleared this up for themselves and for us actually so might be a little challenging to audit that but I know we can find a way so with that is there a motion so I move that City Council adopt proposed uh, ordinance 21-10 second I have that Miss Ramsey made the motion and Vice Mayor Dent was the second Sarah Mr. Rogers aye Miss Ramsey aye Mayor Pons aye Vice Mayor Dent aye Mr. Maslin aye well, so that takes us to item D, consideration and approval of resolution 21-21 to apply for the FY2324 Transportation Alternative Set Aside Program funds for the College Woods Circuit Trail. Mr. Small, welcome. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council. Um, today, we're, uh, the city is in the process, or we started our, to prepare an application uh, for funding, federal funding, for uh, what we're calling the Collegewood Circuit Phase 2. Uh, we call it Phase 2 because we're considering Phase 1 to be the, uh, what was called the Monticello Avenue um, multi-use trail. Uh, that was funded by the same funding source, transportation uh, alternative set aside. And uh, what this, the reason we're calling it the Collegewood Circuit is it would provide a circuit, uh, a bicycle um, and pedestrian facility that would go all the way around uh, with South College Woods uh, and eventually uh, connect up uh, at College Corner at Richmond Road and Jamestown Road. So it would go all the way around the main campus as well as uh, Lake Matoka and the woods surrounding it. Uh, so this would be the second phase. We do have a third phase eventually planned uh, that funding is also being sought uh, through the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization, uh, the HRTPO, and that is uh, being sought through a raise grant, uh, which used to be called BUILD, uh, and before that it was called Tiger Grants, uh, another federal aid program. Uh, the estimate for this phase, uh, which is a little over uh, one mile, it's 1.275 miles, uh, would run from Berkeley Middle School down to Berkeley Lane, right off John Tyler Lane. Uh, and it would be a separated path, 10 foot wide, uh, shared use path, very similar to the Monticello Trail. And um, we would replace some sidewalk between Berkeley Middle School and Strawberry Plains uh, neighborhood. Uh, it's currently five foot wide, we would go 10 foot wide there, uh, but pretty much in the exact same spot. Uh, and then from there, it would pass through another portion of College Woods, uh, staying behind the back side of the ditch uh, for the most part uh, until we get to Berkeley Lane, uh, where we would just tie right into the edge of the pavement. Uh, and that's also where we begin bike uh, lanes uh, at that point. Uh, so it would actually be functional from started from the very beginning. Um, the program uh, would provide funding uh, for about 80% of the total estimate, uh, and so that would require a $455,480 match uh, for the program. That's an 80-20 federal aid program, uh, and those funds would be um, available beginning in fiscal years uh, 23 and 24, so it would be over the two-year period uh, should we be awarded the grant. It is a very highly competitive grant. Uh, matter of fact, I just saw this morning in uh, WI Daily about York County applying for similar funds. And so we would be competing with uh, places all over, but there's certain set-asides for uh, individuals in the MPOs. So it's just a very competitive grant program but we've been pretty successful here in Williamsburg. Uh, and with that, um, what we're asking is uh, approval of the resolution and to support uh, that would allow us to proceed uh, with the application as well as um, uh, should be, be awarded any funds, city manager would be allowed to approve and move forward with the project. Uh, any questions? So I don't have any questions, but I'll just say that, you know, this. This is a program that I think we've all talked about, and certainly it's in our goals, initiative, and outcome uh, document to, to have this circuit completed. And so having the opportunity to apply for funds, um, other people's funds, is a good thing. So we're going to count on you, Aaron, to be successful in this. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Mr. Vice Mayor. So thank you, Mr. Small. Just, um, just remind me, so what if, if everything went through, grants approved, when do you anticipate? Um, well, funding would be available starting in 23 and 24, and usually with these federal programs, they run on about a three-year total cycle. Uh, and that's been very consistent for all of the federal programs that we've run through so far. Um, it takes about a year of the design and environmental permitting and such. Then you've got to deal with utilities and uh, property acquisitions should be, they be required. That usually takes up the other port another year. And then there's usually about a year allotted for construction. So, okay. And then you mentioned, so it's basically going to follow 
Strawberry Plains on. It'll be follow Strawberry Plains on the city side of the road. Yes, like, and behind the di behind that. But it, it'll be behind the ditch, uh, in front of the you know uh, on the existing where the existing sidewalk is. Uh, we're going to try to avoid most of the power lines so that we don't have to move them uh, to minimize that cost. So we might have to swing behind power lines in some spots. Uh, we want to watch out for some parking lots, uh, existing commercial entrance signs, uh, those kind of things. So our intent is to try to minimize uh, how we impact, especially when we get up into the neighborhood area uh, along Strawberry Plains. We want to try to minimize the existing landscaping. Right. Um, because as our um, colleague from the fiber optic company mentioned, you know, people's front yards goes all the way to the edge of the pavement, and they planted that prize tree. Even though it's in the right-of-way, it's not, you know, we want to make sure that we kind of minimize those personal uh, things. Okay, thank you. In terms of the overall project, uh, is, are, is there any funds coming out of the federal government in terms of infrastructure uh, that could be uh, captured? And... Uh, do any of those programs give you benefit by being shovel ready? In other words, if we do the design work up front? Um, we don't know yet. I, I, there are some programs out there, um, but most when they say shovel ready, uh, they mean that you've got your concept uh, and scope down, not necessarily hard design yet, uh, or property acquired. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of a misnomer in a lot of ways, um, but it might mean you've got to jump on it. So instead of a three-year project, it might be two. Uh, so there might be some things that you can circumvent. Um, I'm not sure where the infrastructure bill is going right now. Uh, that's probably your best bet on funding becoming available fairly soon. Uh, and I know I'll be talking with the city manager about, you know, that once it comes all out. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I think this is an exciting project. Uh, I remember when I first joined council, the multi-use trail at Monticello was but a dream, and here it is. So, um, so I'm excited to see phase two um, come through. So speaking of that, since we were successful getting phase one done and have a plan for phase three, does that increase our sort of competitive edge when the, the grants are, are reviewed? I, I believe it actually does uh, because it's one of those, uh, unlike investments, past performance do, is a good indicator of future uh, gain. And uh, plus we've kind of also got other projects under our belt, federal funding. So it does help us uh, know that Williamsburg is a locality that can be awarded money and they will spend it uh, within the allotted times and stay on schedule. So that we've got a really good reputation right now. We make things happen, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as uh, the match, you said that this would be done over a two-year time frame. That's potentially. correct. So would that mean that our local match would be divided up into two years as well? Yes, and actually it, it, the local match is just at the end of the project. Uh, how we would probably have to allocate this in the budget is we would be awarded uh, funds uh, for the project with the local match to accompany it. However, we would need to budget the full amount uh, hmm. because like most federal pro aid programs, these are reimbursement programs. So what we have to do is spend it and then they'll pay us back uh, the 80%. So the local match gets spent when we spend right. the money. Um, most of the times on these programs, as I said, it's a three year schedule. Uh, you don't really start spending the real money, uh, the volume of it, until the second or third years when you're really starting into the construction phase. Uh, and so a lot of times we can make the timing work out with the, how the fundings are allocated. And I will work hard with uh, the finance department on that. Good. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. And this is a very easy thing to support. Uh, I'm hopeful that one day w with the funds, um, that you will assuredly achieve, that we'll see phase two play a part in potentially the, the boat connection from the Capitol Trail to the city of Williamsburg, mm -hmm. as uh, this route through John Tyler has been shown to me as the quickest way to get from Williamsburg to the, the Capitol Trail. So this would be a, a, a big win in our camp. My only question is, should we apply and, and be awarded the funding? When would we know 
that, that will be coming to the city? Uh, most of the time, I believe they actually will make the awards. We would probably know uh, sometime in May whether okay. the award will happen. Um, that's been typical of past years uh, prior to COVID. COVID threw a big wrench into those timings. Uh, but uh, typically the CTB will meet in June uh, to make those awards so that they become available in July, on okay. July 1st. Well, great to know. Good luck. Thank but you. we know ahead of time in May because we got to be on the agenda. Got it to support. Thank you. Is there a motion? So I move that City Council approve Resolution 21-21 to authorize the City Manager to proceed with applying for FY23-24 transportation alternative set-aside funds from VDOT and to execute all necessary documents relative to carrying out programs for any funds awarded. Second. I have that Ms. Ramsey made the motion. Mr. Rogers was the second. Sarah? Mr. Rogers? Aye. Ms. Ramsey? Aye. Mayor Pons? Aye. Vice Mayor Dent? Aye. Mr. Maslin? Aye. Thank you. This takes us to E, consideration and approval of Ordinance 21-11, an ordinance to ban the use of expanded polystyrene food service containers. July 1st of 2025, the state can impose this uh, ban and enforce that or the locality can enforce that. The reason that it needs to be in the city code is because there is a provision that allows the restaurant to apply for an economic hardship exemption for a year that can be renewed and they do that with the local government. And so this ordinance contains those pro prohibitions, contains the extension process for a food service vendor to request an extension due to economic hardship um, and the penalty section which is a $50 per day civil penalty for the use of these uh, food service containers that are prohibited that would be in the jurisdiction of the circuit court interestingly not the general district court if the city of Williamsburg brings the case against a food service provider as defined by the the ordinance who is using polystyrene containers, the city keeps that $50 fine. Um, if the state brings the enforcement action, then it reverts to the state fund, one of the state funds, I think the environmental fund. So this brings that into the city code under chapter 12 with those provisions um, specifically to allow for that extension. But economic hardship, just because of the cost? Cost they, value of them? Or? Sure. They have to provide and they have to prove that um, there is an, an alternative container that they can use and that it's going to cost them a substantial amount of money that's going to produce a hardship, economic hardship for them. So there's actually a defined provision about what they have to prove to the city manager. Well, I'll miss the flavor, but good riddance. Um, <laughs> Vice Mayor. Ms. Hilton, how, how did we envision enforcement? Is that just in response to complaints? So the state process is a website that um, they are supposed to set up for you to complain to the Attorney General's office. But we certainly would get complaints and have done under other um, provisions of the state code that we don't actually enforce and we end up with those complaints anyway. Thank you. No questions? No questions. I have none either. Thank you. Is there a motion? So I move that City Council adopt Ordinance 21-11. Second. I have that Ms. Ramsey made the motion and Vice Mayor Dent was the second. Sarah? Mr. Rogers? Aye. Ms. Ramsey? Aye. Mayor Pons? Aye. Vice Mayor Dent? Aye. Mr. Maslin? Aye. Thank you. So that takes us now to our second open forum. An opportunity for somebody to come forward or anybody. So state your name and address. Good afternoon, David Cranville, 201 Harrison Avenue. Well, first of all, I want to compliment you. As I've seen over the last two months, and particularly this session, amazing number of some small, some huge uh, uh, items that you've passed. Uh, 
particularly, for example, just uh, opportunity as we brought up with the tax increase that we create a plan for covering, as you explained very clearly, both the, the vice mayor and the mayor, how uh, we solve a problem and allow us to keep moving forward for those of us who can't afford a tax increase. But I'm here to try to make a general suggestion that I shared with several of you over the phone. I, I mean, for me, the country, and it comes all the way down to this city, and city council and our city government, is facing humongous potential crisis. This virus, if we don't bring it under control, is going to raise havoc for not just months, but seasons and years. Because if we don't get to what all the experts say is 80% of our population vaccinated, the virus will continue to multiply and feed. And even worse, it will mutate without question into other forms which will inevitably become more powerful and more deadly. And that will be devastating for the future. Can't have that happen. So, as you all know, when you get elected to be a church, an elder, or a deacon, or you get elected to and asked to be run the United Way Fund, or you get on the board of CDR or Meals on Wheels, you have a lot of responsibilities. But a huge one is to communicate. Communicate individually with people. Low-key communication. And in my mind, the first level of dealing with this crisis is communication. We have virus illiteracy, or lack of virus literacy. We have people who are nervous, getting terrible information from all kinds of sources. We have people who have other friends who say certain things. It's all well-meaning, but it's creating a huge problem for us to get to what we want to be able to say is 100% by definition, with the known exceptions that we'd all accommodate and accept percent of the people vaccinated and we need lead institutions to get to a hundred percent we already have examples of huge airline corporations that have taken very strong steps we've seen a food processing tyson's corner tyson's food and locally we've seen in a very painful way the landings adopt a hundred percent vaccination beginning of october and even small companies like my, the people who helped me with my air conditioning, Cypher's plumbing, going to 100% vaccination, painful as it may be. If I understand it correctly, over in our administration, building the Commissioner of Revenue has worked campaign to accomplish that goal. So, but the, as I go back to the key, it's communication. And I, I'm simply asking you to work with the city manager and the police chief and the head of the fire department and, and the Dan and whatever. Because the key is the supervisor cannot do this. You would have to do it. And your friends have to meet individually with these people who are still struggling with the question of why I'm a nervous or don't want to get vaccinated. So I just simply remind you or urge you or suggest or kindly hope that we can make it an effort to do the kinds of things we do if we were in the church or in a fund or whatever. Find people, right kind of skill set to reach out to these people and number one, listen, and then try to help them so that we can positively and gently approach 100% vaccinated employees in the city of Williamsburg and become a lead institution. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Okay, is there anybody else who'd like to come forward? Uh, Mayor, if I might, I, I didn't mention during my report, but I, I, I meant to, and that is that we handed out the FY22 adopted budget to you. And I just wanna take a minute and say thank you to Ms. Dammon and her staff. Um, 
if you've not had the chance to flip through it yet, I hope that you will. I hope the community will, will stop in and take a look at this. This is the best budget book I've ever seen in the local government. Um, and I'm not just saying that because it's mine. I, I think this is an unbelievable achievement by Ms. Dameron. Um, it, 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 there aren't words to explain how great this is. I, I know the budget is typically boring, but I assure you that this one is not. <laughs> certainly comes nicely packaged in a way that I've never seen. And so um, uh, all the content inside is, is well done as well. So you, thank you, uh, both of you, for putting that together for us. Thank you. Is there anybody else? No? We'll close the open forum. And I'll turn to Mr. Vice Mayor Dent, who I think we have closed session. We do. I move to go into closed session pursuant to section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia for the purpose of discussing one personnel matter per subparagraph one concerning appointments to boards and commissions. Second. Rivet. We had the, the motion was made by Mr. by the Vice Mayor Dent and the second was Mr. Maslin. Sarah? Mr. Rogers. Aye. Ms. Ramsey. Aye. Mayor Pons. Aye. Vice Mayor Dent. Aye. Mr. Maslin. Aye. We'll take a couple minute recess and then adjourn in the back for a closed session.